open those Bible apps uh, to, to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 1. Uh, now, uh, really, today as we, as we begin this, this new series that we're going to be spending um, some time in, uh, we're going to introduce ourselves to this new series uh, by, by looking, first of all, at the first four verses. So with that, Luke writes to us in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and Luke says, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and, and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things with which you were instructed. And so, Lord, we, we, we pray that that would, would be what would take place in this, in this place today, Lord, that you would, would, would help us to know the certainty of those things that we've been instructed, uh, the, those things verse by verse, line upon line, precept upon precept, that we've been taught, that we've got from your word. Help us, Lord, to know the, the sure foundation of your word, that with certainty, no matter what we go through, high or low, we can stand on the solid foundation of your word. So we love you, we worship you, and we open our ears to hear from you today. In Jesus' name, and everyone say it. Amen. Well, now, the, the title of this message the, this morning, and really not only the message, but the whole series itself in the Gospel of Luke, is the gospel for the lost and the found. The gospel for the lost and the found. And really, we get that title from the key verse of Luke's gospel. The, the key verse. In fact, uh, let me share with you the key verse of the whole book of, of Luke. It's Luke 19.10, where Jesus says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, that's the key verse. You know, sometimes you're, you're reading in a book of the Bible, and, and sometimes you, you find one verse that really outlines that whole book of the Bible. One verse that tells you the purpose of that whole book. And for us, that's Luke 19.10. In fact, if you're taking notes, let me show you how that breaks down. Let me show you how this whole book follows that one little verse. For example, uh, chapter 1 through chapter 4, really the, the first part of chapter 4, chapters 1 through 4 show us the Son of Man coming on the scene because Luke 19.10 says the Son of Man has come. So that's chapters 1 through 4. But then chapters 4, 4 through 21 show us Jesus seeking the lost. Seeking the lost. That's chapters 4 through 21. But then chapters 21 through 24 show us uh, Jesus saving the lost. Saving the lost. So chapters 1 through 4, he, he comes on the scene. 4 through 21, he seeks the lost. And then 21 through 22, he saves the lost. Because Luke 19.10 tells us, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so that's Luke's purpose in writing this book. And, and really, uh, it, because of that, he places a special emphasis on, on the outcast, a special emphasis on, on the sinner, on the lost. In fact, Luke's gospel is going to tell us certain things that the other gospel accounts do not tell us. Now, you know that there are four gospels, the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Mark, the gospel of Luke, and the gospel of John. And they each have their own purpose. But Luke, his focus is on the lost, on the outcast. And so because of that, Luke tells us certain things that the other gospels don't. For example, Luke's the only one that tells us the, the story of the good Samaritan, who would have been an outcast, by the way, in that day. And he's also the only one who tells us the, the, the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector who go up to the temple to pray, or, or, or the, the persistent widow, or the story of the, the healing of the ten lepers, or the thief on the cross uh, who, who in his last dying breath cried out and said, Lord, remember me in your kingdom. And Luke's the only one that tells the story of short little Zacchaeus up there in that sycamore tree. Or then again, uh, Luke is the only place where we're going to read the parable of, of, of the prodigal son, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost sheep. Because Luke places a special emphasis on the lost. It's the gospel of the lost and the found. It kind of reminds me of the movie Forrest Gump. 
Remember that scene where, where you know, Lieutenant Dan comes back from Vietnam. He's lost both of his legs. He's, he's angry. He's bitter. And he turns and he says, Forrest, have you found Jesus yet? Kind of sounds like Yosemite Sam, right? And, and in that moment, Forrest turns and he says, Well, I didn't know we're supposed to be looking for him. Well, well, Luke tells us it's the other way around, that we might not be looking for him, but he came looking for us. He's come to seek and to save that which is lost. It's the gospel for the lost and the found. So now with that, I want you to go back, look at the first two verses again. And as you do, I want to show you the unique thing about Luke. Not, not, not the gospel of Luke, but the man, the author, Luke himself. So Luke says again in verse 1, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and, and ministers of the word delivered them to us. <coughs> Pardon me. So Luke right away mentions those who were eyewitnesses and those who were ministers. Now obviously he, he's talking about the 12 disciples. But you see, right, right away, uh, here's the unique thing about Luke. Uh, the unique thing about Luke was, was that Luke was not one of the 12 disciples. He was not one of the original eyewitnesses. In fact, for that matter, uh, another unique thing about Luke is that Luke wasn't even Jewish for that matter. You see, uh, Luke, in many ways, is a lot like me and a lot like many of you in that Luke wasn't really even raised in a quote-unquote religious home. He, you know, he, he, unlike the, the 12 disciples, Luke wasn't Jewish. He, he, he wasn't raised in the, in the religion, in, in the tradition, in the rituals uh, of, of Judaism. In fact, really, he's the only known Gentile, that is, non-Jewish writer of the pages of Scripture. Now, another unique thing about Luke is that we also know that Luke was a medical doctor, um, a, a physician. We know that, by the way, because uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 14, the Apostle Paul calls Luke the beloved physician. The beloved physician. He was a medical doctor. And then something else. Uh, we know in verse 24 of the book of Philemon. Now, remember, Philemon's only one chapter long. So in verse 24, uh, the, the Apostle Paul calls Luke his fellow worker in the gospel. His fellow worker. And then also 2 Timothy 4.11, the Apostle Paul states that, that Luke was the only one who was still with Paul. When the Apostle Paul was locked up in prison, in a dungeon, Luke was the only one who was still there. And so all of this tells us that, that Luke was a well-educated man, but at the same time, he was a faithful man who could be trusted through thick or thin. And in fact, it's believed by many that, 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 that Luke was probably the Apostle Paul's personal physician. You know, we know that the Apostle Paul had, had various medical issues, and many believe that Luke traveled with Paul as his doctor, as his personal physician. Here's what Chuck Swindoll says about Luke in his commentary. He says that Luke had the mind of a scientist and the heart of an artist. And so, in many ways, the Gospel of Luke has been called the most scholarly, scholarly book in all of the New Testament. The most scholarly book in all the New Testament. And so on the one hand, Luke, a, a medical doctor, writes with, with, with precision and detail, and yet at the same time, there's the, 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 the flair of the poetic in his writing as well. And so in many ways, you could say that, that the gospel of Luke is really the gospel for those uh, who, who weren't raised in the church, the gospel for those who weren't raised in religion, the gospel for those uh, who, who weren't raised to believe. It's the gospel for the unchurched. Now, again, we, we mentioned there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And each of these Gospels ha ha have their own purpose. For example, the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, his purpose was to illustrate Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, uh, to, to, to illustrate that Jesus was the fulfillment of Old Testament Hebrew prophecy. That's, the Matthew, uh, that's Matthew's Gospel. But then John's Gospel w w was to illustrate the deity of Christ, that he was God wrapped up in human flesh, God in flesh. But then uh, Mark's Gospel is to emphasize the servanthood of Jesus Christ, that he didn't come to be served, but rather to serve. But, but Luke's unique. 
uh, Luke, uh, being the only Gentile, the only Greek author, he, he doesn't focus on, on Old Testament Hebrew prophecy. In fact, by my count, there, there are less than 10 references to Old Testament Hebrew prophecy here in Luke's gospel. Compare that to Matthew. In, in Matthew's gospel, there are well over 50 references to Old Testament prophecy. In, in Luke, uh, unlike all the other gospel accounts, Luke doesn't give us a lot of, a lot of Hebrew terms, a lot of Hebrew words. And in fact, what's interesting is that by the time we finally get to the crucifixion account over in Luke chapter 23, we see that, that Luke describes the place where Jesus was crucified um, in, in Luke 23, verse 33. And yet, instead of using the word Golgotha, which was a Hebrew term that Matthew used over in Luke, I'm sorry, over in Matthew 27:33, Luke instead doesn't use the Hebrew term. He uses a Latin word. He uses a, a Roman word, Calvary, which translated means skull, because Jesus was crucified at the place of the skull. Now, again, what's the name of our church? Calvary Chapel. R really, Skull Church, right? So what, I mean, are you thinking what I'm thinking? I'm thinking we should get some nasty old ratty leather coats, big skull patches, maybe a leather, with, a leather wallet with a chain on the side, you know? Maybe some tattoos. Bad. Bad. Yeah, that's a bad idea. That's what a lot of you are, I see a lot of this going on right now. A couple people are like, hey, yeah, man, I'll pay for it. what this shows us is that, is that Luke didn't use the language of religion to communicate with. Luke used the, the language of the people, uh, the language of the day. Uh, you see, Luke didn't write in such a way that only those versed in the Old Testament would be able to relate with. He, he didn't communicate in such a way that only those with a Hebrew background would be able to understand. You see, Luke uh, was able to take the simple truths of the Scripture and then communicate them in such a way that anybody could relate with it, that anybody could get it. You know, to paraphrase the, the words of the late J. Vernon McGee, uh, Luke had the unique ability to take the cookies off the top shelf and put them down at the bottom where even the kiddos could get to them. Communicate it in a way that anybody can get it. Why? Because what was Luke's purpose? Luke's purpose was to remind us that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And let me tell you that, that in many ways, Luke's purpose is our mission, right? I mean, our mission as Christians is, is to reach the lost. I mean, our mission as, as, as believers in Jesus Christ is, is to present the gospel in such a way that anybody can get it, that anybody could understand it. And you know what? It's been said that there's five Gospels. Now you're thinking, wait a minute, preacher. I just heard you say there were four. Actually, there's five. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you. And check it out. If they don't like what they see in me, if they don't like what they see in your life, then you know what? They're not going to want to see the other four, right? And so we got to make sure that we're living this stuff. And we got to make sure that, that when we communicate it, we also communicate it in a way that they can get it, that they can understand it. we got to put it down at the bottom shelf. And so this is what Luke does. He, 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 he communicates it in a way that anybody can get it. And listen, <coughs> this is, <coughs> is paramount. I mean, we need to know this in our day. We live in a day where we're right now in our day, in our time, there are more non-Christians, more unbelievers in our country than ever before. Sociologists are now saying that we live in what they call post-Christian America. In fact, according to, to one study by the Barner Research Group, the United States of America, with its 195 million unchurched citizens, has become the new mission field of the world. Another study says that the United States now has more unchurched people than the entire populations of all but 11 of, of the world's 194 countries. I mean, check it out. A lot of times we raise money and we send people overseas to preach the gospel, right? And we need to do that, but check it out. <laughs> uh, uh, we're being told that Christians in other countries are actually sending their missionaries here to preach the gospel. We have become the world's new mission field. It's, it's right underneath our noses. In fact, according to Tom Clegg and Warren, Bo Warren Bird in their book titled Lost in America... The unchurched in the United States of America is so vast that if they were to become their own nation, they would be the fifth largest nation 
on the planet. And so check it out. Yeah, we need to go overseas. We need to reach the lost. But check it out. Some of you, you don't need to buy an airplane ticket. You just need to go to the office. You just need to go to the next cubicle. You just need to go to your next door neighbor. Listen, we are living in the new mission field. I mean, check it out. Brighton, Colorado, mission field. Uh, Lock Bowie, Colorado. Henderson, Colorado. Uh, you know, Fort Lupton, Colorado. Mission field. Listen to this. Reunion. And by reunion, I mean Commerce City. And hey, Commerce City has a lot of lost people in it, right? New mission field. And so what we need to realize is we read this. Uh, this, is, this is the gospel for the lost and the found. He came seeking to save that which is lost. And we don't need to be all religious and, and phony when we share it. We need to take it down to their level in a way that the lost can get it so that they can be found. Now with that, uh, now as we look again at the first three verses, now Luke sort of cites his sources, kind of like the bibliography section of a, of, a, uh, of a research paper, right? So Luke says in, <clears throat> in verse 1 again, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who were from the beginning were, were eyewitnesses and, and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account. Now let's pause there. Now what I want you to see here right away is, is that Luke never claims that, that he is, is the original source of any of this inf information. In fact, he, he clearly states that, that there were others who had written these things before him. The eyewitnesses, the, the ministers, in other words, the 12 disciples. And basically, he's stating that, that he's actually using some of their material as he compiles his writing, as he puts his writing together. What's he doing? He's citing his sources. Do you know what they say? If you cite your sources, it's research. If you don't, it's plagiarism, right? But then again, uh, uh, Charles Spurgeon used to say, and I've heard others quote it, like Chuck Swindoll and others, but, but Spurgeon was the first. Spurgeon used to say, all originality and no plagiarism leads to dull preaching. <laughs> and so Luke's citing his sources. And so Luke, with, with his scientific mind, is letting us know that, that he, he carefully researched all, all his material. He, he carefully studied and interviewed these eyewitnesses and, and listened to the preaching of these 12 disciples. And he took notes, and he compiled it all together, and he's, and he's put it here for us. He's citing his sources. Because, you know, now, nowadays, plagiarism is kind of a big thing, right? In fact, nowadays, there's even uh, a term being thrown around called pulpit plagiarism. Uh, and, and, and you'll notice uh, we started uh, our last series started putting in the bulletin for you a list of some of the resources that I draw from uh, when I'm doing my study to prepare these uh, and so we have a, a just a, you know, a handful of things so if you want to go and, and dig deeper you can uh, speaking of, of pulpit plagiarism a, a relatively well known pastor uh, just recently not, not too long ago really he's also an author it was found out that, that some of these books that he, he had written, he didn't actually write. As, as it turned out, they were word for word identical to someone else's books. He just kind of repackaged it, if you would. Now that pastor's had to step down. Heard about another pastor who, who, who was being charged. And, and so he, he stood up to the pulpit and he says, now, I, I want to res respond to these accusations. First of all, yes, much of last week's sermon was directly lifted from the pages of the scripture. And no, I don't consider that plagiarism. And so Luke's citing his sources. He tells us the eyewitnesses. He tells us the ministers. But if you pay attention carefully, you're also going to notice that he indicates and cites one more source. You see, Luke indicates that he, he also had the guidance of the Holy Spirit in this process. Let me show you. Uh, for example, after he cites the eyewitnesses and the ministers in verse 2, he then says in verse 3, it seemed good to me also, having uh, had perfect understanding of all these things from the very first to write an orderly account to you. Now, notice that phrase, very first. Uh, in the original, this is the Greek anothen. And this is a, a term that can be translated just like it is here, very first or very beginning. But this is also a phrase that can be translated from above. From above. For example, in, in, in John chapter 3, verse 31, uh, John the Baptist talks about Jesus and he says, He who comes from above is above all. 
And then likewise, in, in John 19, 11, Jesus responds to Pontius Pilate, and he says, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. And it's the same word that, that Luke's using here. As if to let us know that, yes, these were the things that he received at the very beginning, at the very first, but these were also the things he had received from above. Luke's letting us know that this is much more than just a thesis paper. He's letting us know that this is much more than just a research paper. He's letting us know that, that his writing was actually being directed by the Holy Spirit, that his words were inspired by the Holy Spirit himself, that this was Scripture. Keep in mind, as we've said before, uh, we need to remember that the Bible is not just a book, right? You know, it's not just a, a history book or some kind of a document. I mean, it's the inspired Word of God. It, it's God-breathed. It, it's Holy Spirit-directed. Listen, there's power in the Word of God. There's power when you read the Word of God. And yet a lot of us, quite frankly, we, we sometimes lose sight of that, don't we? I mean, sometimes we just read this book like it's any other book, some kind of history book. In fact, even Gandhi years ago uh, uh, saw that with Christians. And here's what Gandhi said. He said, you Christians. Okay, I'll, we'll stop there. <laughs> he said, you Christians ha have in your keeping a document in it with enough dynamite in it to blow this world to bits, to turn society upside down, and to bring peace to this war-torn world. But you read it as if it were just good literature and nothing else. Even Gandhi could see that. Listen, uh, there's, there's, there's something ha that happens when you read this book. There's power in this book. There's something that happens when you read this book that doesn't happen with any other book on earth. It actually speaks to you. It, it comforts you. It, it, it encourages you. It challenges you. It convicts you, but it literally speaks to you. There's power in it. Why? Because it is the Word of God. And Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword, and it penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Check it out. <laughs> it knows what you're thinking before you think it. It judges your thoughts and your attitudes. It penetrates the heart. It pierces the heart, even between soul and spirit. Listen, that, that's why that, that even when you're listening to, to a sermon preached on the Word of God, you may be at church or maybe on the radio, but you're, you're listening to a sermon, and then all of a sudden it just nails you. I mean, it just smacks you right between the eyes. I mean, like you're the only one in the room, like it's talking just to you. How many of you have been there? And, and, you know, and it just kind of nails you, right? Hey, by the way, let me say this. On the subject of plagiarism, let me say this. You know, sometimes you know, you're listening to a sermon, maybe even a sermon from this pulpit, you know, and then all of a sudden, the, the Holy Spirit uses that to, to, to speak to you. It penetrates your heart. It challenges you or it encourages you, but he uses it to speak to you. Well, hey, listen, in that moment when the Holy Spirit now speaks to you, listen, that, that now becomes your truth. It becomes your truth. Check it out. It, it's, not, it's not mine. It's not property of Calvary Chapel Brighton. And so if, if the Holy Spirit uses something that's preached from his word and it speaks to you and it ministers to you and it, it, it changes your life, well, listen, that's now yours. And now what you do is you take that that the Holy Spirit's given to you and you share it with others around you. That's what Luke did. Luke took what he heard from the eyewitnesses, what he heard from those ministers, from the 12 disciples, and Luke took what he got from the Holy Spirit and he gave it to us. It was meant to be shared. This is the gospel for the lost and the found. And so here's what I want you to do over these, these next several weeks, even months as we go through the book of Luke. I want you to take good notes. I want you to really pay attention. And then I want you to take what was given to you and take it to work on Monday and give it to someone else. I want you to take it to your next door neighbor and give it to them because this is the good news that was meant to be shared with the lost that they might be found. And you've got a lot of lost people in you. I know you do, because the statistics say you live in the new mission field. So now after he cites his sources, now Luke is going to tell us who he's writing to in the first place. And so uh, again in verse 3, he says, It seemed good to me also, having perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. And so evidently he's writing to some guy named Theophilus. 
And we don't know a lot about this guy. I mean, I mean, we don't know what he did. We don't know where he came from or anything else. I mean, all we really know is his name. And now, we know it's a Greek name. In fact, it's made up of two Greek words. The first is theos, which means God. And the second comes from the root for the word phileo, which means love. So you put it together, and literally, he was a lover of God. And so whoever he was, we know that he was a believer. We know that he was a Christian. We know that this was a man who who believed in Jesus Christ and has now become a lover of God. Now, Warren Wiersbe and others in their commentaries point out that more than likely, Theophilus was a Roman official who became a believer in Jesus Christ. A Roman official who, who gave his life to Jesus Christ. Now, here's why they point that out. Here's why they say that. It's because of what Luke calls him. Notice, Luke doesn't just call him by his name, but after he says, to write to you in order the account, most excellent Theophilus. Now, you see, we have a problem. A lot of us, we don't read that correctly, especially those of us that grew up in the 80s, and you know who you are. You know, some of us, when we read that, we read it as if we're reading out of the, the newly inspired Bill and Ted translation. Most excellent Theophilus. But that's not what Luke was saying. That's not what Luke was saying. It, it really, what we need to understand is, is that this was really a title. This was a, a title of, of position. You know, it'd be, it would be like saying your excellency or your honor. And that's how it's used not only in that day, but even in the scripture. You may re- re- recall that account where, where, where the apostle Paul was arrested for his faith, put on trial for his faith, and now has to stand on trial before the Roman governor Felix. And so now he, he addresses, uh, as he stands on trial, he addresses the Roman governor Felix in Acts chapter 23, verse 26, and Paul says, most excellent governor Felix. And so it was a title, like your excellency, like your honor. Now something else that we need to know is that we need to realize that in those days, doctors were actually slaves. Physicians were owned by other people, by the rich and the wealthy. Now, you know, nowadays, the, more, more often than not, the doctors are the rich and the wealthy, right? But in those days, they were the slaves, and they were owned by the rich and the wealthy. And so because of that, many speculate and many believe that, that, that more than likely, whoever Theophilus was, he may have been uh, Luke's slave owner and slave master. But now that he's given his life to Jesus Christ, now that he's become a lover of God, he now sets Luke free and, 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 and releases Luke to travel with the Apostle Paul on Paul's missionary trips and, and chronicle all that and write it down. Uh, that's called the Book of Acts. Luke is also the author of the Book of Acts, where Luke chronicles uh, in, in every detail of the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys, every place that he went and, and, and every place that he preached the gospel and every place that he planted churches. Because listen, that's what missionaries do. They preach the gospel and they plant churches. And so Luke records all this for us. And so we don't know. Maybe, maybe Theophilus turned to Luke and said something like this. He might, he might have said, hey, Luke, I'm going to give you a grant. I'm going to underwrite uh, all your traveling expenses, and I want to send you around the world with, with Paul here, and I want you to, to write every detail of the gospel story and then send it back to me so that we then can share it with others in their language in a way that makes sense to them. And so Luke wrote this to Theophilus, the, the lover of God. Now, by the way, practically speaking, by application, you, you could say that in a secondary sense that the Gospel of Luke was written to anybody who's a lover of God. Anybody who's been touched by God. Anybody who's been transformed by the power of God and now has become a lover of God and now wants to take what they've gotten from God and give it to the world around them. For the, so lover the lover of God, God who wants to, wants to reach, reach the lost, the lost that they might, they they might become found. found. So now with that, now with that having told us who he's, who he's, he's writing to, now Luke now tells, tells us why he wrote, he wrote this, wrote this in, the first in the first place. We see that, we in, see verse that in verse 4. Luke says, Luke says that you may, that know, you may know the certainty, certainty of those, those things in things which you were instructed. Now, notice, now that, notice that word certainty. Uh, in, the, uh, in the original, it's the Greek It can be translated, 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 can be translated, translated reliability. reliability. It can be translated, it can be translated, translated to be certain without a doubt. A doubt. That's why That's one English, English translation, translation of the Bible renders it this way. This so that so you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt the reliability of what you're being taught. 
the Jinnah beyond a shadow of a doubt. And so, so Luke, by, by, by using this word certainty, is, is making it very, very clear that, that he believed that the proper telling of, of, of these events, the, the clear presentation of, of the story of Jesus Christ, the, the declaring of the truth of the gospel, which is, would be enough to produce belief. Just declaring the truth of it would be enough to lead people to faith. It would be enough to remove all doubt. Even as, as Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That just declaring it would be enough. And so Luke's mission was to declare the truth of the gospel to the outcast, to the sinner. Uh, to, his goal was, was to declare that Jesus has come to seek and to save the lost. And evidently he, he, he was convinced that if he just preached it, if he just declared it, it would do the rest. All he had to do was declare it and preach it, and then it would transform lives. You know, we mentioned Charles Spurgeon a while back. Years ago, uh, in the 1800s, uh, one of his students came up to him and said, well, 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 Pastor Spurgeon, how do you defend the Bible? And Spurgeon just laughed, and he said, how do you defend the Bible? He says, man, that's like asking, how do you defend a lion? Brother, just let it out of its cage, and it'll defend itself. And sometimes we just got to let it out of its cage. Sometimes we just got to open our mouth and preach it and then let it do the rest. Just preach it and see what happens. I told you before the story of Gaylord Kambarami, who uh, years ago was the general secretary for the Bible Society. He's in Zimbabwe. He's giving out New Testaments, and he, he offers a New Testament to this soldier. And the soldier tells him, look, if you give that thing to me, I'm just going to tear the pages out of it and roll them up into cigarettes and smoke them. And Gaylord said, fine, but just promise me that you'll read them before you smoke them. Well, years and years go by, and they, and they cross paths again, but this time it's at a Christian conference where that soldier now is the keynote speaker, and he's sharing his testimony. And he shares his testimony on how this guy gave him a New Testament. He told him, if you give that to me, I'm going to roll him up, turn him into, into cigarettes. And he said, just promise me you, 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 you read them before you smoke them. And so he says, I smoked Matthew, and I smoked Mark, and I smoked Luke. But, but when I got to John 3.16, I couldn't smoke anymore. My life got changed from that moment on. Listen, there's power in the Word of God. That's why I've devoted my life to preaching it. There's power in it. Listen, there's something that happens when, when, you, when you read the Bible that doesn't happen with anything else. I mean, it pierces the heart. It changes lives. And Luke's purpose was to preach it. Luke's purpose was, was, was to remind us that Jesus came to seek and to save the outcast, the, the, the reject, the sinner. It's the gospel for the lost and the found. But Luke also reminds us by his own example that you don't have to be preachy in the process. You don't have to sound all religious and, and phony. You, you know, you don't have to be fluent in quote-unquote Christian ease. You know what I mean? I mean, you, haven't you realized that as Christians, most of us now speak a new language? We have our own code. We speak in a way that no one understands unless they've been initiated into our club. It's true. I mean, think about it. I mean, you know, we use crazy phrases like, you know, we're going to lay hands on you. You lay hands on somebody at the mall, you might get, you know, in trouble for that. Or, you know, somebody might say, you have a servant's heart. Have you heard this? You know, and now listen, if you're not a Christian or if you're a new Christian, you may not understand this, so let me help you. What this means when somebody says that you have a servant's heart, that just means they, they want you to clean the bathrooms. That's what that means. Or, you know, a hedge of protection. Somebody come up and say, well, you know, I'm praying a hedge of protection over you and your whole family too. Really? A hedge? I don't mean to complain or anything, but is that the best you can do? I mean, couldn't you pray for like a big concrete wall with, with razor wire all over that bad boy? I mean, a hedge. I mean, you think a good set of clippers just get right through that, right? I mean, you think the devil's going to be scared off by a hedge? What is this shrubbery? I mean, we've been bushwhacked. I mean, how do I get through this hedge of protection? I mean, sometimes we, we as Christians kind of forget that nobody understands what we're talking about. That nobody can relate with us. You know, it's kind of like three guys who, who died and went to heaven. This is a true story. Uh, <laughs> and Peter turns to the first guy and, and he says, you know, how did you get here? What did you do uh, be, before you died and came here? He says, well, I was a preacher uh, for 50 years and I preached faithfully for 50 years. And, and Peter says, oh, good. Just sit down. I'll be with you in a minute. Turns to the second guy and says, what about you? What'd you do? He says, well, I also was a preacher and I preached faithfully for 40 years. I'll be with you in just a minute. Sit down. Turns to the third guy and says, well, I suppose you're a preacher too? 
He says, no, I, actually, I was a taxi cab driver for six months, got in an accident, here I am. Peter says, oh, good, come on in. And the, other, the first guy's like, wait a minute, what gives? I mean, why does this taxi cab driver get to go into heaven before two preachers? Peter turns and says, hey, listen, when you two guys preached and talked, nobody understood the thing you're talking about. You use all these big words and these, these theological terms, and nobody got it. In fact, listen, this taxi cab driver here uh, scared the hell out of more people in six months than you two did in a lifetime. <laughs> this just reminds us what, what, what he's looking for. He, he's looking for people like, like Luke. He's looking for people who, who still speak human people who still speak the language of the people, people who, who can take the, the truth of God's word and explain it in such a way that anyone can get it. Let me put it another way. The, the, explain it in such a way that even a redneck could get it. Or, or, <laughs> or a Brightonian can get it. Hey, you might be a redneck if. No, wait, wait. And so, you know, he's looking for someone who, although you've been a Christian for years and years and years, you know, you've been saved for decades now, you uh, still speak the language of the people. We don't mean vulgarity uh, or anything like that. We just mean that you have the ability, you, you haven't forgotten where you've come from, and you can still talk to them at their level, where they're at. Because this is the gospel for the lost and the found. And he's still seeking, and he's still searching to save the lost. And so here's what we want to do. You notice in your bulletins, we've, we've put these in, this insert in here. Now, this was a mailer that I did. Uh, we mailed it out to about 5,000 homes, but that's not all of our area. So now uh, we've delegated the rest to you. And so now what you get to do is you get to take this and, and, and you get to, to share this. You, you invite people, invite your coworker, invite your neighbor to come and hear the message that Luke is going to proclaim. But check it out. If you can't bring them to church, then bring church to them. Take good notes, and then take what you get here on Sunday. Bring it with you on Monday. Or grab a CD after church and bring it to them. Because Jesus never said that the whole world was to go to church, but he did say that the church was to go to the whole world. And so we can go from here. We'll equip you, because that's our vision, but we can go from here, and we can reach this mission field. So that's your mission, should you choose to accept it. And so, Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for this new series. We pray that your Holy Spirit would equip us with your word. Lord, that you'd give us the courage to step out and to be bold, to take risks, to be vulnerable. Because, Lord, after all, you, you took the greatest risk when you died for me, when you died for us. And so, Lord, we pray that, that we would put it all on the line, just like you did for us, that we would put it on the line for you, put it on the line for our, our lost friends and, and, and coworkers and even our frenemies. Or that you would seek them and then save them and that we would tell them. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we stand and worship the Lord? Oh, yeah, it is communion today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so our, our, why don't you sit back down because it's going to get a little messy. <laughs> you ever feel like the monkeys are running the joint? Uh, so the ushers are going to come down and, and hand the uh, elements. February is such a tough month. It's already over. Uh, so uh, the ushers are going to come down, and they'll pass you your elements. Uh, just, you know, get back into an attitude of worship. But listen, in this book, he, we, we see that Jesus died for your sins. So take a moment and reflect on what Jesus did for you. And, and, uh, and, and, and remember that his blood was shed for you to wash you white as snow. His body was pierced and broken uh, that, that you might be whole. And so, Lord, bless this time of, 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 of communion, uh, this, this time of, of remembering what you did to have a relationship with us. We worship you now in Jesus' name.